an answer time and whilst I'm uh, inviting the people to come to sit at the, the, uh, on the stage here, I'll introduce Wayne Marks. Wayne, if you're coming up for the question and answer time. Yeah. Wayne, as you probably know, ladies and gentlemen, is the independent king of Baptist Church land. And I'll just briefly tell you, his working life commenced in the exploration of mining industry, doing geology. He subsequently took up his interest in finance and commerce, completing a Bachelor of Business degree and still later undertaking a graduate diploma in human resource management. He is a fellow CPA and spent 20 years with Western Mining Corporation Resources in the Eastern Gold Fields, Adelaide and Melbourne. In recent years, he has devoted considerable energy to environmental and conservation activities in the Western region of Perth. He is currently the Chairman of the Western Region Environmental Network. Now, we've got some microphones here that can be passed around the audience. Mel, are you here? Who's going to hand these round? Richard. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'd love to have your questions. Um, as I said, we would like to finish at 9.30. That gives us 25 minutes of question times. If we finish before that, we can go home early. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience? I hope you haven't been bamboozled, but as you can see, these speakers know what they're talking about, and there is a lot to learn. Are there any questions? One at the back. Um, and I'll first make a comment. I'm just so grateful I'm not an Egyptian citizen living in Cairo, where an undemocratic and dictatorial leader has taken away all the people's rights, uh, with no appeal to the judges. But I draw no comparison between that situation in Egypt and anything in Australia. Now, my question is, you've mentioned a number of times about corruption. Before I came, I had a quick look through the Australian Crime Commission 2011 report on organised crime in Australia. Has anyone looked at the influence of organised crime in any of the corruption cases that we've seen in the larger councils? One of the areas that it's most prevalent is in waste collection. We have a great waste collection system developed by um, the previous town clerk, Subiaco. Uh, the private uh, waste collectors in Europe are suffering because they're not getting a return on capital employed. So, do you think there is a possibility with larger councils the um, opportunistic organised crime will see the vulnerabilities and try and get in and get their cut? Thank you. Who would like to answer that question quickly? Right. The simple, the simple answer is, of course, the simple answer is yes. Uh, what, as someone has mentioned earlier tonight, the moment that you have larger municipalities, greater number of people, you have fewer accountability, or fewer opportunities for accountability and transparency from elected members, and more delegated authority to council, to officers. And the moment you have delegated authority to officers, then you allow the way clear for decisions to be made by officers that may or may not be accountable. You may or may not discover them until after they happen. And so it's a high probability that the further you get from the ability of elected members to monitor what officers are doing, that uh, mischief will occur. So no surprise at all, and the answer is yes. Yeah, the City of Stirling now had a uh, Triple C investigation in uh, early last year, year before. I live in the City of Stirling and um, uh, I went to a quite a number of council meetings and had some media press about the City of Stirling's uh, corruption and the process and lack of... Uh, and the delegated authorities or lack of them and um, in fact the... Uh, the the uh, accounting procedures and processes that run within the city, so they have made some significant changes. But that's a that's a classic example, just within a, a uh, the, the local area from where we are. That uh, you've had large council, largest council in, in metro area, where you've had uh, recent corruption practices. Another question, please. 
Uh, just, just before we go on, Richard, um, there, there was actually a, a very good uh, DVD made by um, one of the film producers uh, regarding the Leichhardt uh, Council in New South Wales. Uh, there was so much corruption in New South Wales Leichhardt Council that the, uh, the movie was called Rats in the Ranks. It's, uh, it's mind-boggling when you watch it. Hello, uh, my name is Elizabeth Ray. Uh, I'd just like to say I think all the speakers were really great and I think the people need to be more informed of actually what's going on, so I totally support everything everyone said tonight. Um, with the DAPs, are you aware that in New South Wales that they are really pushing to overturn them because they've seen what's happened in there and there's a big report out that actually could be used parliamentary-wise? Um, my question is for Lynn, if you don't mind. Um, with regard to SAT, which I could write a book about all the things I think are wrong with SAT, um, the problem is with SAT, is anybody raised the issue in government that they actually, about the members on the SAT panel? We talked, um, the comment made earlier, for those that don't know, that DAP is made out of so-called experts and also counsellors, and of course counsellors are selected by factions, so not necessarily at all in the support of the community. But the SAT members, I find, are questionable, for want of a good adjective, um, that whether or not you could raise in Parliament uh, how the people are elected on SAT and whether or not you can find some of their names, but it's very questionable the SAT members that actually hear some of the decisions and the decisions that are made are not consistent at all, but are more motivated, in my opinion, by political um, gain and power tripping and very much aligned with planners. So I don't think I've seen it, and if it has, if you could point it in my direction, but if it hasn't, I'd be really good if you could raise the issue about the SAT members, because I think if we're going to look at decision makers, whether they're elected members on our local council, which we should support totally. Um, uh, questionable those on that, but definitely questionable on Sorry, that. your question is? The members on SAT to be investigated. The people that sit on SAT, are the you, decision Are you addressing your question to any particular? To Lynn, the Honourable Lynn McLaren. Briefly. <laughs> I'll take that question, thank you very much. Um, I was elected about three and a half years ago, and one of the most uh, comprehensive reviews of the State Appeals Tribunal uh, was tabled at that time and debated. And there is, it, there is such a wealth of knowledge in that report. It's one of the most substantial reports I've done about that beat. And um, I would commend that to you. Uh, of course, uh, this government has entirely backpedaled and ignored every recommendation in that report, but that report does say how SAT is functioning, how it can be improved, and you're, you're right on the money in saying that they are not democratic, and that was when they were introduced. I was working for a member of parliament, and that's exactly what we said. We said... There's, there's a lack of transparency, there's a lack of accountability, and it is this devolution of democratic power from the community to individuals. And one of the things that I argued heavily for in the DAPs was that the membership would be broad-based and have some sustainability criteria. We, we also argued the same for SAP. And I think there is one person charged with looking after the world, the environment, one person on SAT who's, who's supposed to know something about the environment. And in the DAPs, um, we did argue that the quorum had to include local government people because the way that they originally proposed, it was like a panel of five, they could make decisions with two people, and neither one of them had to be a local government person. So it was pretty bad, and, and we did argue to um, improve representation, and the minister did agree. If I could say something on this. So in um, my professional career, I've had quite a lot of contact 
with the SAT and appeared there many times. Um, I haven't heard a lot of criticism of the members, but I have heard substantial criticism about the ethos of how they operate, and that is that they are set up to find a solution. And this encourages the AMBIT claim and the SAT finding a solution which is somewhere in the middle of um, what the developer puts up first and, and what the council or the DAP decide. So I think you should bear in mind what the alternative was before we had the, the uh, SAT, and that was all appeals decided by the minister. Now, to my mind, and I've, and I've seen uh, both systems operate, the SAT is, is by far preferable. And if you think about environmental appeals, which still are decided by the minister, I believe that it would be better for environmental appeals to, to be decided by the SAT. So um, the SAT has its problems, but I, I think there are other things which are, which are worse. Are there any more questions? I've just started to read the Robert Flynn book. And so it's in the beginning of the covenant section, they're talking about the... Um, Can you speak up? I can't hear you. Okay. I'm reading the Robertson report and regarding the um, governance section with regards to the Chief Executive Officers of the new regional planning groups. As I remember the report, it was saying that the CEOs of the new councils, they are going to be somehow put under the Public Service Board in terms of uh, remuneration, and it almost as if their appointments were going to be approved by the Public Service Board. Now that would indicate to me that the CEOs of the regional council are actually being employed by the governments and they're contracted out to the council. Am I reading the report, the, the recommendation correctly? Who was to answer that? I can talk. Uh, I'm also just chairman of the Western Metropolitan Regional Council, which the five member councils in the western suburbs are members of. One of the recommendations, I think recommendation six of the Robson report, is that that the five regional councils be be wound up and be replaced by, I think it's recommendation possibly 14 or so, the, by the, the state government creating a department of waste. And if you don't know, in the metropolitan area, the five regional councils collect about a million tonnes of, of waste a year. And at the present time, the vast majority of that goes to landfill. So if the, gov the government has a proposal that uh, towards 2020 is a diversion of waste from landfill, the reality is, as we sit here right now, the government has no plan for that to, to be able to be achieved. And to be frank, the regional councils are pushing ahead to trying to find solutions in their own way, the five regional councils, try to find ways to deal with the waste presently going to landfill. And you may or may not know that at the WMRC we're building the Dicon plant, which will divert 70% of waste from landfill through an organic process and create compost. Now that doesn't answer your question, that's by way of a brief commercial from the WMRC. <laughs> but the point is, and the important point, is Robson's recommendation to do away with the regional councils, which represent uh, all member councils, and to create a department of waste. And it's that is the point where you start seeing the emergence of a very large entity that, again, has none of the accountability that we have at the present time. It's rather ironic that the state government treats us like children, so under the Local Government Act we have very limited capacity for any entrepreneurial activity, and yet we are held accountable for the cost effectiveness of what we're doing. So typical, typical uh, approach in regard to waste, for example, the innovation uh, that Mr. Marmion kindly gave us about 12 months ago, e-waste, 
which uh, we estimated required annual funding of about $800,000, and I think Mr. Marmion gave us $50,000. Now, the problem with that initiative is that it creates the community expectation that the service will be provided, then the government withdraws the funding or fails to provide adequate funding, and then the regional councils, and more particularly the member councils, then have to fund the community expectation. So it's that classic cost transfer uh, exercise which has been going on forever. But anyway, to answer your question, yes, it would be my understanding that if Robson was adopted that there would be a Department of Waste and that would just be another government department that would come under the control of, as a government, um, as a public service. Ron, you were never this verbose when you were on the City Council. <laughs> uh, questions, please. If you could keep them brief, that would be helpful. And uh, hopefully we can finish the, uh, the night as I promised at 9.30. Um, I'm one of the bunnies from Catherine Street, and I've done a lot of reading since that event occurred on the 8th of March. Um, and one of the things I find perplexing, I'd be interested to hear what people think, is... You read so many of the, um, the legislation and the state government policy documents and my favourite of all of them is the Freedom of Information Act because when I read it I feel like I live in a democracy. Um, and I just wonder how have we gone so far off that path into this, um, this state that we're in. And what's driving it? Why is it happening? It's not happening by accident. So who is behind this uh, change that's occurred and where are the best of interests? If anyone's got any theories on that, I'd be happy to hear. Brief answer from someone. Follow the money. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who, who are the major supporters of the, the major political parties and who's got the most to gain? And uh, they're the major contributors and so they're the ones that are setting the agenda. I think it's, I have a similar answer. I do think that developers, the property industry, and particularly in planning, the property industry stands to benefit the most. And so they would definitely be behind reforms which would streamline processes to get their projects approved. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily think, uh, although I haven't talked to Max about this, we should probably talk later, but I don't think it's necessarily a, a master plan. I think it's more likely um, a, a, a lack of someone paying attention. You know, I think that we have trusted government, and particularly the Australian culture, and I've been here since 83, so I, can, I think I'm beginning to understand the Australian culture. I think we trust government, and I think government is proving that we need to, to steer it more, and we need to pay more attention, and we need to speak out more, and those are not natural things to do, because we, she'll be right, is a is a very common response. And I don't, I don't, I think if anybody has anything to be gained, then it's pretty easy to steer this government, or either government, as you've named, both um, of the old, we call them the old parties, we don't call them the major parties. Um, do any of, both of the old parties sort of suffer the same problem, that they're easily steered, and they are susceptible to donations. Um, but I think I think we I think we have the power to turn it around just by waking up, and by speaking up, and by not letting it happen. As you saw with Barnett at that meeting the last time, uh, when the premier you know delivered the report, you know you put enough pressure on him and he said, okay, well, here it is. And I think um, that generally people go into public life to try and do the right thing. And if we tell them what the right thing is, and if we don't let them misbehave. And I think they'll do the right thing. Hopefully. 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 I'll Richard. take one more question. Can I just make a couple of comments? Um, John Booth, for the resume. Uh, I'll make it brief, please. Please. Yeah, Yes, firstly, I wanted to say um, well done to all the speakers. I think you spoke incredibly well. Yeah. I was uh, uh, very impressed with what you said. Um, a number of us have been very concerned about the development of 263, 277 uh, Hay Street which is a five-storey development that uh, is about to be handed down 
Uh, Ra reports due to uh, Subiaco Council on Wednesday, goes to DAP on the 14th of December. Uh, we're obviously very concerned about it. Uh, it breaches TPS in many different areas. I think the thing about tonight that I realise is that it's about people speaking out. There's certainly a lack of democracy, a lack of transparency through to SAP. Uh, the developers have been the ones pushing this, I believe, throughout, and it's up to us. At the end of tonight, I think it's up to all of us to go out and speak to five or ten people, to speak to your neighbours, to talk to people, to let them know, because what will happen otherwise is people will say, let's have less government. Let's say we get rid of one layer of government, and it'll be local government that'll go, because people will say, yeah, we'll save some money, it'll be easier, we'll get better decisions. That'll be the simplistic view people will take without really looking into it. So you need to have a voice and you need to speak. You need to talk to your neighbours, you need to get out there and you need to be heard. And apathy will be what wins at the end of the day if you don't. Thank you. I think we finished question time there, but if you would bear with me, what I'd like to do is to do what we did down at Cottesloe and I asked the audience three questions and if you would be prepared to do what we did down at Cottesloe and respond with a show of hands, I would be very grateful, as indeed the speakers would be as well. So the first question is, how many of you feel that the government's centralisation of planning powers and the disenfranchisement of local government is unacceptable, that the development assessment panel should be terminated and the right of appeal restored and public open spaces be preserved? If you're in favour of that, would you please show your hands? Sure, that's right. So that looks like a human unanimous vote. Thank you. The second question is, how many of you would support a statement of no confidence in the Planning Minister, John Day? Oh, that, that's, that, that's a mere rush. That's a mere rush. And thirdly, how many of you would say, no local government organisation without majority community support? I'm sorry, no local government reorganisation without majority local support? Thank you very much for your readiness to, uh, to respond. I'd now like to call upon Mr Colin Matcham to wind up the proceedings. Well, thank you very much, panel members, and thank you very much, uh, audience. It's been an extremely interesting uh, evening. I, I, I only just want to say one or two things. Uh, first of all, I think what we realised tonight is that these concerns are above party politics. This is, this is, um, this is something of, of massive importance to, to our lives. In answer to the lady who, asked behind, who is behind all of this, it is quite interesting to see that one of the strongest lobbyists for forced amalgamation and the retention of the debts is in fact the Property Council of Australia, WA branch. It's interesting too, the way the language of this has changed. We first of all we were talking about mergers, then we were talking about amalgamation, then it became change, now it's become reform. This is a kind of George Orwellian thing going on here, because if you look up reform, it's, it's putting right malpractice, uh, non-operational things, abuse, corruption. Well, where's the evidence of that? Why, why are we having, even having, you know, the Robson report? The last message I'd like to put to you tonight is this. Please, if you've been moved uh, by what you've heard tonight, join the Western Suburbs Alliance, give us your support, support the independent candidates, tell your friends all about these issues, and please let us know what else we can do. Thank you all very much. Would you please put your hands together for the speakers who delivered their addresses tonight?